Good morning. We have two scriptures this morning. First one is Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, no seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord among brothers. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to mature Christians. I had to talk though you belong to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you milk feed you with milk and not with solid food because you couldn't handle anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your own sinful desires. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your own desires? You are acting like people who don't belong to the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. This is our uh, last week to look at the text that we've been looking at now for several weeks out of the book of Proverbs. And um, when you look at this last one, that God detests the person who stirs up conflict in the community, it seems pretty cut and dry and it seems pretty simple, doesn't it? The children, even this morning, as I shared with them about a troublemaker, they said, you know, God doesn't like a troublemaker. And most of us would share that opinion as well. We don't like troublemakers either. And on the surface, again, that seems like a a pretty easy understanding. The problem is, if you know anything at all about the Bible, if you have ever read the stories, or if you know very much of anything about many of the Bible characters, you know that many of those individuals were people who did, in fact, stir up trouble and dissension in the communities that they were a part of. And so you look at this and you wonder, so what's, what's going on here? I mean, just think about the Old Testament for a second. If you're really going to say that God doesn't like the troublemaker, God doesn't like the person who stirs conflict up in the community, well, you pretty, have, you pretty well have to throw out all of the Old Testament prophets. Because the Old Testament prophets were people who, for the most part, were troublemakers. All you have to do is read it. When you're looking for material on this, the problem is not finding material, it's editing it down so you can kind of share just bits and pieces of it. But if you've ever read very much of the prophet of Jeremiah, let me just share a little passage out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, this is out of the 20th chapter. Jeremiah is now in the process, the priest who is there He had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Why did he do this? Well, the nation is at war. And Jeremiah is saying to the people who are in siege in the city, God is not for us. God is against us. The whole thing is going to fall. God is going to destroy everything. Those who are not killed by the sword will be carried off into captivity. All of our work, all of our efforts are in vain because God is against us. We will be delivered into the hands of Babylon. Now, if you happen to be one of the people who is in the city under siege, if you happen to be one of the officials who is trying to keep everybody together, who is trying to hold the fort, That's not necessarily the message you want to hear. Proclaimed by someone who is recognized as someone who speaks on behalf of God. And therefore, Jeremiah was treated very poorly in his ministry. He was thrown into prison over and over again. He was dropped into a bottom of a well. He was put under house arrest over and over again. Why? Because Jeremiah was a troublemaker. I mean, he shared the word that nobody wanted to hear, and no matter what they did, they could not shut this guy up. A lot of the other Old Testament prophets fall into the exact same line. These are people who introduced conflict and dissension into the community. Doesn't end with the Old Testament, though. It goes right on. All you have to do is start reading the Gospels. 
In the gospel, Matthew 10, beginning at verse 35, Jesus is saying, Do not suppose that I come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a father, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. That's Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but you read that verse of Scripture, and I'm thinking, you know, this is not the guy to invite to a family reunion. Time he's there a few minutes, everybody will be at each other's throats. There is a reason that we say when you're in company with one another, you don't talk about religion or politics. Jesus always talked about religion, and uh, Jesus had a lot of enemies. And there were a lot of people who called and referred to Jesus as a troublemaker because he brought dissension and division and conflict into the community. Doesn't end with Jesus, though. If you go on through the disciples and into the early church, if you read the book of Acts, I mean it is one story after another. The story of Stephen. Stephen is seized and brought to the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts because he is proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to the people. A a word, a news that brings dissension into the community. And this is a part of the early church. And then when you get a little farther in the book of Acts and you pick up Saul or the, pro, or the apostle who becomes Paul, what you recognize the fact is this guy is in trouble all the time. Paul is constantly in prison. I have no idea how many times the guy got beaten. There were people after him to kill him over and over again. This is out of the 21st, verse, 21st chapter of Acts. He, Paul is in Jerusalem at the temple. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like somebody's causing trouble to me. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't even end with the biblical story. Because once you move out into just our heritage as Christians, you run across a character like Martin Luther. Martin Luther nails his doctoral thesis to the door of the church, which was a common practice in that day, but most of the things he had to say, the people in authority in the church didn't want to hear. He was considered a heretic in the church. He caused division in the church that has just trickled down for centuries now. But even if you go back to our own heritage as Methodists, John Wesley spoke in the open fields because John Wesley got kicked out of every pulpit in England. Nobody would let that guy come and preach in his church. What he had to say, nobody wanted to hear. This guy was a troublemaker. He was a rebel rouser. Everywhere he went, the pastors were just sorry they had ever let this guy in to speak. But it doesn't even end there. It's part of our history, this congregation as well. Some of you may have been here when Bill Lewis was here. I've heard the story from Bill. Bill was pastor here when the churches were united. And the big uniting, and this was a very, very full building when those two congregations came together. It was during the time, though, of the early years of the Civil Rights Movement when we were celebrating, getting ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary of our sanctuary. Bill came and spent part of an afternoon in my office just sharing the stories of that whole union But what he went on to say was, not too long after all of that came together, he decided to become active in the civil rights movement and took a trip to march in one of the civil rights marches in the South. And his own words said, and it pretty well split the church. A couple hundred people pretty well left because of that. 
I don't know if you agree with Bill or do not agree with Bill. I'm just talking about somebody who introduces conflict and dissension into the community. So, does the writer of Proverbs have it wrong? Is he right the first time and says there are six things rather than seven? Is the seventh a mistake? Because if it isn't, it seems like there are an awful lot of people who we read about in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament who are part of our heritage and our history, both as Christendom and even right here in our own congregation, who find themselves in one way or another, detestable to God. So, is he wrong? I don't think so. I don't think he is. I think the Bible story is that God loves unity. And God wants people to be united. I think the biblical story is that God loves harmony and God wants people to come together and be together and work together. I think that's the Bible story. I think part of that is because God understands the tremendous power people have when they come together, when they are united, when they are a force that is moving together for the right and for the good. The problem is people don't always move together for the right or for the good. And when they don't, someone has to stand in opposition to that. Someone has to shout out against that. And when we do, there is almost always conflict And there is almost always dissension. I think the heart of God is for unity. I think the heart of Christ is for unity. And I think this last thing that the writer of Proverbs writes about does express the heart of God. Of all of the things that you look at, and all of the references I've made this morning and hundreds more that could be made, they have a couple of things in common. One of them is that they all created conflict in the community, but the other is that they were all an instrument of God in that conflict. I think what I walk away from this text with is this. And it's God saying, Larry, if you ever intend to do anything that is going to divide or stir up conflict in the community, you better make sure I'm in favor of it. Because you are accountable to me. Because I don't want the community divided. And I don't want to see conflict in it. And if you think it needs to be there, then it better be about a whole lot more than your personal preferences. Or what you think's right or wrong. You better know you're working as my agent and you're working for me. That's the only reason that I would ever want the community in conflict is for its correction and for its edification. And so in this very last one, which seems to be to me by far the most confusing I think it carries that weight with it. The writer is right. 
God doesn't like trouble in the community. God doesn't like conflict in the community. God doesn't like it when it needs to be there. And for that reason, you need a pretty good reason to put it there. It's not about what I like or what I don't like, what I prefer or what I don't prefer. It can only be about what God wants and what God calls. Anything other than that, we need to realize we will stand accountable to God, accountable to God for that issue. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, our history is a history of So much conflict, God. So much trouble. So much dissension. As we have tried to find you and your way. God, help us to always be peacemakers. Help us to always be those, Lord, who seek the way that brings unity. Who builds the spirit of harmony. And help us, Lord, to take so very very seriously any time we step out of sight of that. Surround our hearts with your love and your grace, God, that we might accurately serve you and you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here, and I'm glad to be here, thanks to the good Lord. I didn't bring a piece of paper because if I minutes after I write it, I can't read it. So it's, it's all going to come from my head and from the bottom of my heart, what I have to say. I was born April the 3rd, 1930, to my mother and dad. I lived on the 80-acre farm. They farmed put me through school, me and my sister to high school. Um, I tried to get work around here, didn't find it, so I went to Granite City and went to work up there in Nesco. Worked five years for them, and out of that five years, the good Lord seen it necessary for me to go in service and serve my country. I spent uh, two years in active duty, along with my National Guard time, And he was good to me because instead of going to Korea, I got to go to France. I spent 13 months in Bordeaux, France. And that was a blessing of what was going on. And I came back, worked for a while where I was at at Nesco. They closed. And again, the good Lord was with me. They sent my name over to Grand City Steel and referred me there. I went there and I worked 30 years for them and retired the last day in 1985. But in that time, in 1951, after I'd went to work at Nesco, Vi became a part of my life. We were married, 7th of April of 51. And from then on, life seemed to be much easier. She'd become my pillow. If it hadn't have been for her, God only knows where I'd be today. She took care of everything in the house and all, and I was the breadwinner. And we worked and saved and got by until I retired in 1987, at uh, 85, last day of Jan- uh, December. And then we came down here, we had a new home built, moved in it, and we got to talking about going to church. And we hadn't been to church because mom and dad lived on the farm, and from the time I was big enough to remember, I don't ever remember them having a day off. Cows to milk, everything to do on the farm to keep things going. And I wasn't brought up in the church, and I regret that to this day, but I'm trying to make up for it now. Uh, We had a sister-in-law that went here, Maxine White. She invited us to come to church with us. Well, we did, and from the first day we came in this church, we was all, 
welcomed with open arms, love, hugs, everything you can imagine. Friends, we knew some people because both and I went, her and I went to school here and, and we had a lot of friends. And it's increased, got more friends as time went on. After we joined the church, we became active in everything that we possibly could. I served three years at the Board of Trustees, one year with a, or a term in the church council. Was on the building commission from the beginning of the end to fix up this church. And people, let me tell you, you've got one of the nicest churches to go to this side of heaven and the Lord's with us all, all the time. Remember that. So we was active in everything we've done, worked in all the funeral dinners. I become fix it. I've done it, painted the doors. I've worked on everything in this church. I've been in every nook and cranny, know it by heart, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. It was great all the way through. Then when Vi began to fail in her mind, she was on the casserole ministry for many years, took care of that, and she couldn't do it no more, and it really worried her, and she cried a lot about it. So she left that, and things just gradually got worse, which it happens with that Alzheimer's. And then when it got to where I thought I couldn't handle it no more, here come the church members, my friends, my loved ones and all, helped me with things that I could have never done on my own. The only relief I could get when things really got down was if I could get my Bible and go off someplace and sit down and read it a while. Then I could get relief because God was with me. And that is what it's all about. As long as you can keep God on your side, you've got it made. And he'll love you if you plow around the stumps. It's easier. Life is much easier. Let me tell you. So whenever she really got bad, it helped me with things that I could have not done by myself. And I'm grateful for that. And I want to thank each and every one of you that helped me in any way, shape, or form with getting things settled and get me where I'm at today. And it's still going on. I still have a lot of loving friends here and I'll never forget them. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and wish you all the very best. Thank you. God bless all of you. <laughs>